or so of scriptures and uh, two long columns that I gave to Josh, or as he would say, Brother Soundman, and uh, Mr. Soundman, that was <laughs> Mr. Soundman. Uh, we're not going to try to cover all of this tonight. We'll just go as far as time will permit. And uh, we'll pick up next week, Lord willing, and the next and the next, and however many weeks it takes us to cover. I, I can foresee at least, at least three weeks minimum of trying to cover the topic at hand and perhaps more. I will say again, and, and in case I forget to say it, that as we go through really all of these, even though we, we do individual series, uh, all of this, until the Lord says otherwise, I'm going to be just teaching biblical doctrine. And as we go through these biblical doctrines, uh, please feel free to submit questions, send them by email, or write, just write them anonymously, leave them at the sound booth, or uh, whatever. And uh, ask any questions. Uh, usually, uh, towards the end of the lesson, I will get two questions um, and deal with them. And so your question may already be in my notes to be covered. It doesn't hurt for you to ask just in case. Because I want everyone to understand these subjects clearly. Amen. I, I, I don't believe that there is anything in the Scripture... Uh, doctrinally that God has left ambiguous. I, I don't think that God leaves these important topics uh, just up for grabs. I believe that He has provided answers in His Word and uh, it's just a matter of searching the Scriptures. Amen. And rightly dividing the Word of Truth. And when we do that, we have answers. We have answers. Hebrews chapter 6, and we will begin with verse number 1. Hebrews 6 and verse 1. The Bible says, Therefore, leaving principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, and of laying on of hands, and of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. This will we do if God permit. Now, a couple things I need to say here. First of all, what he said in verse 1, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, Let's go on to perfection. He's not saying that we should never discuss these issues. He's saying these issues are settled. And there comes a time in our Christian walk that we need to get beyond just these issues. There's a lot more in the Scripture than just this. However... The Apostle himself dealt with these issues uh, at times when he felt it was necessary. So he, he was trying to say to the Hebrews in general that, look, there comes a time you've got to get beyond these items. There comes a time in your walk with God that we've got to get on to some deeper things. But he wasn't saying they're not important. In fact, he called them the principles of the doctrine of Christ and he called them the foundation. The foundation. And what is the foundation? Repentance from dead works, faith toward God, the doctrine of baptisms. That's in the plural. Then he goes on and mentions some other things, laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And all of these things make up the foundation of the doctrine of Christ. This is the foundation of the doctrine of Christ. Amen. And um, I will point out to you, that this foundation is not just believing, but it's also repentance and baptisms. 
baptisms. And um, we're going to deal with one doctrine of baptism over the next few weeks. And then when we conclude this, the Lord willing, we will go into another baptism. We want to start tonight dealing with baptism by water. Then in the weeks to come, we'll deal with the baptism of the Spirit. Amen. Praise God. And all these things, again, are part of the foundation of the doctrine of Christ. Repentance, we've dealt with. Tonight, we begin the doctrine of baptism. Amen. Praise God. And uh, So, I, I want you to put your Bibles down. I want you to pray with me. Let's ask the Lord to speak to our hearts tonight. And again, I don't want you just to understand. I don't want you just to comprehend. But I want the Lord to grant revelation in this service tonight. So could we pray that prayer tonight? Let's pray that God would reveal truth to us. Everybody, let's lift our voices to the Lord right now. Jesus name in Jesus name let's praise him one more time everybody can we do that let's give God some praise hallelujah amen amen God bless you you may be seated let me let me just lay a little foundation here uh, a springboard to begin this series of lessons. I want us to go back to to go back to just prior to the crucifixion of Jesus. He's standing before Pilate. and There is a conversation that goes on in Pilate's hall. Uh, In John chapter 18, beginning with verse 33. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it of thee? Tell it thee of me. Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. All right, now, now hang on just a minute. Notice the way the conversations lead. Pilate keeps pressing Jesus to say something that would amount to political insurrection. He wants him to admit to being a king. Jesus really does not answer that question. But he said, I will tell you this. My purpose for coming into this world was to bear witness to the truth. That's what I came for. He said, to this end was I born, for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Read. Pilate saith unto him, Pilate said to him, What is true? What is truth? And when now, he, I, I want to tell you, this is the question of the ages. In fact, any time that you get to dealing with folks and trying to show them Scripture, it invariably comes back to this. Well, how do we know the truth? What is the truth? You say one thing, the church down the road says another. Everybody's uh, saying they're right. How do we know the truth? And, and Pilate asked him, what is truth? All right, let's just finish the verse so we can go on. And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and said unto them, I find in him no fault I find at all. no fault. Now, this is, if you can see up here at the top, and if you were paying attention, This is John chapter, 
Can you see that? John chapter 18, Pilate asks the question. Now, just a few hours before this question is asked, Jesus is standing with his disciples. They have just had what we call the Last Supper or the Lord's Supper. Just a few hours prior. John chapter 17. In that, there was more than just taking the fruit of the vine and the bread. It was church. And Jesus preached a message. In fact, in fact, if you understand the book of John, all of this begins in in John chapter 13. Jesus taking the basin and the towel and washing their feet. But when he finishes that, he launches into a sermon that is covered in chapters 14, 15, 16, and 17. I'm glad I'm not the only long-winded preacher. I just want to be like my Lord. Hallelujah. 14, 15, 16, and 17 is all one sermon by Jesus. Now, in that sermon, while Jesus is preaching, chapter 17, the evening before he stands before Pilate, what did he say? Now, what was Pilate's question? What is truth? What did Jesus say just a few hours earlier in John 17, verse 17? Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Jesus gave the answer when he was preaching. The answer to the question, what is truth, is this. Thy word is truth. There's the answer. Of course, I could get easily sidetracked. I like to say that had Pilate been in church, he wouldn't have had to ask the question. Well, he didn't know the answer. And that's, this is where I could get easily sidetracked because I, I can tell you, honestly, there have been times. This is not an exaggeration. This is not made up. I have honestly had times when the morning after a service, my phone has rung and somebody's called me with a problem or a question and they had skipped church the night before. And in that service that they missed, their problem was dealt with or their question was answered. Now, I'm telling you, I'm telling you in the sight of God, it is the honest truth I've had it happen. If they had just been in church when they were supposed to, they would have known. That's why I teach it's so important you come to church. Well, praise God. Anyhow, if Pilate had been in church, he wouldn't have had to ask the question. He would have known what truth is. Truth, truth. And, and listen, I don't care what anybody's trying to tell you today. There are absolutes. People want to tell you truth is relative. Truth depends on your situation. But that's not the case. Truth is truth. Two plus two is four. I don't care who you are or what's going on. Some things are absolute truth. And I'm here to tell you the Word of God is absolute truth. Truth. Now, our opinion might be true and it might not. But the Word of God is true. End of discussion. Well, praise God. Amen. And, and, and so, this is important that we understand as we launch into one of these areas that is so debated among Christians today. Um... You see, there, there's a lot of folks who want to tell you that, well, there are many roads that lead to Chicago, and so there's a lot of ways to get to heaven. And I want to tell you something. I don't know about you, but when I die, I have no interest in going to Chicago. In fact, while I'm alive, I'm not real interested in going to Chicago. Been there, done that. <laughs> but I sure don't want that to be my final destination. And if you're going to go to heaven... There are not many roads that will take you there. If you're going to go to heaven, there's only one way to get there. 
Ephesians chapter 4 verse 5 says this. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Now isn't this interesting? Isn't this interesting? I had a man tell me one time. He said, God called me to preach to all faiths. Oh, really? It's interesting. Also, there was a church that used to have a radio program that their um, uh, motto was, where all faiths meet in faith. I'm here to tell you, scripturally, you can't add an S to that word. Scripturally, there's only one faith. Now, this word doesn't mean here, this, this word doesn't mean trust. It doesn't mean belief for miracles. This word means system of beliefs in the Christian walk. So this is what I'm telling you. This is why it's important that we not just go by our opinion. We've got to find out what is the one faith in the Bible. Not the one faith that is... Uh, Accepted by the majority. But the one faith that is stated in the Bible. Amen. Matthew chapter 7 verses 13 and 14. Listen to what Jesus said. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For Enter wide, at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Uh-huh. And? And many there be and, which go Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now, broad is the way. That leads to destruction. Why is the gate broad the way that leads to destruction and what? Many. Everyone say that. And many there be which go in thereat. Read. Because straight is the gate. Straight is the gate. Narrow is the way. And narrow is the way. Which leadeth unto which life. Which leads to life. And few and, there be that find it. And. We understand there's a difference between few and many, right? Many are going to go the wrong way. And few are going to go the right way. Right. Now, what, my, my whole point of this is, I, I don't want anybody to say, but look at all the people who believe it different. God's not taking votes. Truth is not decided democratically. God states truth, and that's it. It's up to us to accept it. We are not going to be judged by what the majority believes. In fact, we're not going to be judged by what we think, by what we believe, by what grandma told us. And this is another one of those things when I get to talking to people and say, but what about my grandma? She was a godly woman. She, I, I, if anybody went to heaven, my grandma went to heaven. Well, you know, thank God I don't have to sit on the throne and make decisions about who goes and who doesn't go. I'm not here to talk about grandma. I'm here to talk about you. I'll let God take care of grandma. But it's my obligation to talk to you. And you are going to have to search the scriptures and find truth for yourself. And truth is not determined by what grandma did. Truth is determined by what the Bible says. Let me show you. John chapter 12, verse 48. He that rejecteth me and re receiveth not my words. Receiveth not what? Come on, everybody. Help me out now. I know it's Thursday night. I know it's the end of the week. I know you're tired, but help me, would you? The more you help me, the quicker we'll get through. But when you're not helping me, I think you're not getting it. I have to take longer. So, so if we're here an hour and a half, don't blame me. Blame yourself. All right. Now, somebody's getting with the program here. All right. Receiveth not what? Receiveth not my words. Hath one that judgeth him. Hath one that judgeth him. him. What's going to judge him? The word that I have spoken. The word that I have spoken. The same shall the judge, same him, shall in the judge him in the last day. So what is going to judge us? Not our opinions. Not what grandma believed. Not what the majority holds. But what's going to judge us is this book. This is it. This is the line of demarcation. We've got to obey what this book says. Well, praise God. Amen. Uh, the Apostle Paul said this in Galatians chapter 1 verse 8. 
But though we, but or, though we or an angel from heaven or even the angel Moroni preach any other gospel unto you than that which or take we have the eye preached off and some angelic you. moron. But anyhow, I didn't call the people that. I, I'm talking about fake angels, all right? Uh, because any anything that's going to appear, if, 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 and that's a big if, if Joseph Smith really saw an angel, what he saw was a fallen angel. Yes, sir. He didn't see an angel of God. Right. I believe that. And this is the reason why. Because Paul said it doesn't matter if it is an angel from heaven. If they preach any other gospel than that which we, the apostles, have preached to you, let him be accursed. Well, hallelujah. So there is no other gospel. There's only one gospel. There's only one message that we need to preach. And and Romans chapter 3, verse 4, let's read this. God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written. All right, look. I'm going to try to hurry through some of these verses, but this is what's important. Again, it doesn't matter if it's 99 and 44 one hundredths percent of the Christian churches that preach it some other way. We have to let God be true. God's Word is truth, not a denominational handbook. Not a decree from the Vatican. Right? God's word is truth. And so he said, let God be true. But every man a liar. Did that say what I think it says? So when they say, you know, that certain men on earth have the authority to get up and change the scripture. We know better than that, don't we? Let every every man be a liar if that's what they got to be. But God's going to be true. So when it comes to that book, nobody's got the authority to change that book. Hallelujah. Amen. And we must be careful. We must be careful that we do not allow our tradition to stand in the way of truth. Matthew chapter 15, verse 3. But he answered and said unto them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Transgressing the commandment of God by what? Traditions. Traditions. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of folks that, A lot of folks that are so bound by what they've always believed that they refuse to open their eyes to what the Scripture says. Look, tradition may be comfortable. Tradition may be convenient. Tradition may be familiar. Tradition may be acceptable. But look what truth does. John 8 and 32. And you shall know the truth. You know truth, not tradition, but truth. And the truth shall and make the you truth, comfortable. it may not make you comfortable. It may not make you uh, uh, feel convenient. It may not make you feel good about yourself, but it will make you free. Amen. Praise God. All right, so that was just the introduction. So let's talk about baptism tonight. Uh, we're we're going to talk about water baptism tonight, and uh, we're, we're going to... We're going to start, and I doubt we'll get very far, but we'll go as far as we can. I want to start out by discussing the question of whether or not baptism is essential to salvation. Is it necessary, or is it just an outward sign? There are people who believe baptism is kind of like a spare tire. You know, you, you ought to do it. Uh, it's, it's helpful. Um, there are a lot of other analogies that I've heard people use concerning baptism, but again, It doesn't matter what people say about it. What matters is what does the Bible say about it. And so we've got to get into the Scripture and find out what the Scripture says. So let's look at it tonight. Mark 16 and 16 is the first place we're going to start. Mark 16 and 16. These are, if you've got a red-letter Bible, these words are in red in your Bible. These are the words of Jesus Himself. And here's what He says. He that believeth believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And, everyone say and. And. That's an important word. He that believeth and, what? Is baptized. Shall be saved. Shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. He that believeth. Now now look. I've said this so many times, I feel like it's redundant. But it's it's really not redundant. It's really important. Why, 
why don't we just make an agreement as we study the Scripture that wherever possible, we will just take the Bible at face value? I mean, doesn't that sound fair? I don't really think God intends for the Bible to be extremely complicated. Now, there are times when you read it that you can't take it literal. For example, John said, there's one comes after me that he'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. (laughs) Now, we can't take that literal. It's impossible to take it literal. You follow me? But where possible, we ought to take the Scripture literal. And and the Bible says, if you believe and you're baptized, you'll be saved. Now, if I say we're having a formal dinner and the only way to get in is coat and tie, I don't care if your coat costs you $500. Hand tailored in Italy. You don't have a tie, you don't get in. The word and, the conjunction there means you've got to have both. And Jesus said, You've got to not only believe, but you must also be baptized in order to be saved. Now, put the scripture back up there again, Mark 16 and 16. And and, uh, the problem with this verse of scripture is that some folks have written a revised version. And what they're teaching is he that believeth and is saved should be baptized. But that's not what Jesus said. Uh, John chapter 3, we dealt with this when we taught on the new birth, but let's go back and look at it tonight. John chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. All right, now, we we dealt with this extensively when we talked about the new birth, and I really don't want to spend the time to go back and and prove to you what I'm talking about here. But let me just throw this in rather quickly. Jesus said, except a man do two things, he's not getting into God's kingdom. You've got to be born of water, and you've got to be born of the Spirit. Now, there are folks who say this being born of water means natural birth, and this is what I dealt with then, and This is why I don't want to have to just go into great detail. But number one, it doesn't make any sense for Jesus to say there's two requirements. If you're going to heaven, there's two requirements. Number one, you've got to be born naturally. Something about that just seems extremely unnecessary. Two requirements. If you're going to heaven, you've got to be born naturally and you've got to be born spiritually doesn't quite add up. Uh, We talked about the whole dry birth process, uh, babies that are born without the rush of water from breaking of the amniotic sac, and um, I I don't think there's anybody that would say that Jesus would condemn a dry-born baby to hell for circumstances beyond his control. Jesus said you've got to be born of water, and he's not talking about a natural birth. And and let let me give you some scripture to prove that, all right? Now, what, I, I talked about the, the breaking of the amniotic sac in the lesson on the new birth, so I want to take a little different angle tonight as we talk about it. Go over to John chapter 19 and verse 34, and I want to build a little case here. John 19 and 34. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side. All right, now, this pronoun his, everybody understands, is referring to Jesus, right? One of the soldiers with a spear pierced Jesus' side and forthwith came, forthwith there, came out there out and water. Two things came out of the side of Jesus Christ. What were they? Blood and water. All right, now, this is important, and I want you to keep this in the back of your mind. Two things came out, blood and water. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. And so it was written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. All right. Now, now what, what Paul is, is talking about here, what Paul is talking about here is the first Adam was the one in the garden. The last Adam 
is Jesus Christ. Everybody's with me? Now, Jesus is the second Adam. First Adam in the garden. The first Adam brought death. The second Adam brought life. But there is a typology between the first Adam and the second Adam. All right? Let's go back and look at the first Adam and draw an analogy. Genesis chapter 2, verses 21 and 22. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. All right. And he slept. Hang on, hang on. So what condition is Adam in right now? Adam is asleep. Everybody agrees? Adam is asleep. All right, what happens? And he took one of his ribs. He took one of his ribs. And closed up the flesh. Closed up the flesh thereof. instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God and had the taken rib from the man. Which the Lord God had taken from man. Made he a made woman. Made he a woman. And brought her unto the man. All right. Now, the first Adam gets his bride from his side while he is asleep. Everybody agrees with that? The first Adam is asleep. His side is opened. And from his side comes that which will make his bride. This is not accidental, church. God had a plan. Jesus Christ was the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Before God ever said, let there be, He already had a plan in mind. Yes. Yes. He knew what He was going to do. So the first Adam is put to sleep, and the bride comes from His side. All right, let's go back to the second Adam. John chapter 19, verse 30. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar... He said, it is finished. And he bowed his he head. He bowed his head. And gave up the and ghost. And gave up the ghost. We understand in verse 30, Jesus was dead. He died, verse 30. Everybody's with me? He's asleep in death. Four verses later. Go back and put verse 34 back up if you would. John 19, verse 34. Uh, verse 34 says this. Read it for me. But one of the soldiers with a spear... This is after Jesus is asleep in death. One of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side. side and forthwith, and came, there forthwith blood came there out and water. blood and water. Now, I'm telling you, the first Adam got his bride from his side while he slept. The second Adam gets his bride from his side when he was asleep. I'm telling you that from the elements that came out of the side of Jesus Christ is how God makes up the bride of Christ. Yes. Yes. Amen. It's not just the blood, but it was blood and water. This is why 1 John 5 and 8 says what it does. And there are three that bear there are three that earth, bear witness in earth: the spirit, the spirit, the water, and the water, and the blood, and the blood. And these three, and agree, these in three agree in one. Hallelujah! The water and the blood work together with the spirit to make up the bride of the second Adam. Yeah. Well, praise God. We cannot neglect the importance of the water. Amen. So in John 3 and 5, we not only must be born of the Spirit, we've got to be born of the water. Amen. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? All right. Now, this is, and I pointed this out before, this is the first time in the era of the church, in which you have actual sinners asking how to be saved. Now, don't take me to the thief in, on the cross. The thief on the cross was not during the church age. We'll deal with that more towards the end of the lesson. But this is the first time in the church age. The church was born on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. First time in the church age that sinners ask directly, 
what shall we do? Tell us how to be saved. Now, they said unto whom? Are you still out there? They said unto whom? Some of you are thinking about ice cream and sausages. They said unto Peter, that's important, and the rest of the apostles. Men and brethren, what should we do? Now, why is it important that they addressed it to Peter? And Why didn't they address it to John and the rest of the apostles? Why didn't the Scripture say that they said unto Matthew and the rest of the apostles? There's a reason why in there. Amen. We're going to find out that reason. Let's, let's go over to Matthew chapter 16 and verse 19. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of Jesus heaven. Jesus said. Now, uh, those of you that were at Heritage heard Brother Pixler very, uh, in a very scholarly way explain, when you're reading your King James Bible, you should understand the difference between the word thee and the word you. The word thou and the word you. There's a reason why King James put different words. There are times when the scripture says you. No, you're not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. The, the, the word you does appear. It's not thee in every case. The reason why the word thee or thou appears rather than you is because it is singular. It is specific to an individual. If you read the word you or your, it is plural. It's written to a group. Is everybody with me? So he says, I give unto, not you, but unto thee, the keys of the key. He's speaking specifically to Peter. Peter, I am giving thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Specifically, individually, Peter was given the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And so the crowd that day, the, the Bible did not record that the crowd said unto John and the rest of the apostles. Or unto Thaddeus and one of, and the rest of the apostles. Hallelujah. But they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, what shall we do? And who answered? Verse 38, Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Then Peter said then to them, Peter, the man who had individually been given the keys of the kingdom of heaven, said unto them, Repent, repent, and be baptized, and be baptized. Every one of you, every one of you, in the name, of in Jesus the name Christ, of Jesus for the Christ, of sins, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive, and you the, gift shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Well, Amen. praise God. Hallelujah. Now, I don't want to get ahead of myself in this lesson, but let me just let me just throw this out. I'm pointing out that Peter was individually uh, given the keys of the kingdom. It's interesting when you study the book of Acts that you'll find out Acts chapter 2 are the Jews. And the Jews are asking Peter, how are we saved? How do we get saved? And Peter tells them, repent, be baptized in Jesus' name, receive the Holy Ghost. The Samaritans is a second group of people. Uh, they're down there, Philip's down there preaching to the Samaritans, but they can't seem to get the Holy Ghost until Peter comes and lays hands on them. They're baptized in Jesus' name, and Peter prays for them and they receive the Holy Ghost. Peter was there and opened the door to the Samaritans. Who is it that sent to the Gentiles? Now, we know Paul becomes the apostle to the Gentiles, but Paul wasn't the first one to preach to a Gentile. It was specifically Peter who told Cornelius and his household how to be saved. Amen. I believe that all of that is a direct fulfillment of Matthew 16 when Jesus said, I'm giving you the keys of the kingdom. You're going to have to open the door to every class of people, Jew, Gentile, and in between. That's your job. You've got to do the work. And 
He said to them, not believe on the Lord, not accept Christ as your Savior, but he said, repent. We've talked about repentance. And he said, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. And this is probably as far as we're going to get tonight. But I want you to look at a little bitty word here. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. And what's the next word? Everybody say that word. Be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now, why am I pointing out that word for? This little word for in the English can mean many things. But in the Greek, it is translated from the Greek word ice. And, and if we transliter- transliterate that into English letters, it's, it would be E-I-S, ice. I'm not going to give you an in-depth Greek lesson, but I'm just, this is important that you understand. The Greek word ice has a specific meaning. And uh, it means in order to obtain. It's like I go to the store for bread. I'm going there in order to obtain bread. All right? That's what the word ice means. Peter said, you are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ in order to obtain remission of sins. In other words, there is no other way to have your sins taken away except through baptism in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, um... There are those who will argue this point. And they say that there is another interpretation for ice. And that that interpretation is because you have already obtained. Uh, They take you to a scripture, for instance, that the King James translated, uh, they repented at the preaching of Jonah. The word at is ice. Now, they didn't repent in order to obtain Jonah's preaching, they repented because they had already been preached to by Jonah. All right? But, but listen, it's very, we, we don't have to understand Greek to understand those who translated the Bible did understand Greek. And there's a reason why in Acts 2.38 it's translated for. And when it talks about the preaching of Jonah, it's translated at. It may be the same Greek word, but the context is different. Now, you want to see a verse of Scripture where the context is the same and the Greek word ice is used? Let me give you one. Matthew 26, verse 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament. This is my blood of the New Testament. Which is shed, which is shed for, for many, many for the remission of sins. Now, does this, does this phrase sound familiar? For the remission of sins. Does that sound familiar? Use the exact same way as Acts 2.38. Here's what I'm telling you. You don't have to be a Greek scholar to know however you're going to translate for in Acts 2.38, you've got to translate it the same way in Matthew 26.28. It's the exact same phrase. It's the same context. It's used in the same way. So if Acts 2.38 means you're baptized because your sins are already remitted, then the Bible says that Jesus shed his blood because your sins were already remitted. Come on. Come on. And we know that's not the case. He didn't shed his blood because we already had remission of sins. He shed his blood so we could get remission of yes. sins. Hallelujah. 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 And so if this word for... For the remission of sins means in order to obtain remission. Then it means the same thing in Acts 2.38. And I'm telling you, the only way your sins can be washed away is it by being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Right. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Praise God. God. Is it the water that washes it away? No. The water, the Spirit, and the blood agree together. When it's done the Bible way, the blood is applied, and it's the blood that takes away the sins. But you only have access to it when you obey what the Scripture tells you. And the Scripture says you've got to be baptized in the name 
of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me, let me just, uh, I'm, I'm going to close here. I've, I've covered about five pages of notes and I've got 20 total pages. So if we do, if we do five a week, it'll take us four weeks. So let me just, let me cut it right here with, with this. Sister Regan, come. But let, let me just, in, in case you're wondering, I, I, I promise you, I have, I've done a great deal of study on this subject. In fact, the subject of water baptism intrigued me as a young man. And when, when I was only about 14 years old, uh, I took an old-fashioned typewriter. Some of you don't even know what those are. You have to go to a museum to find them. That really makes me feel old. Have you ever seen a typewriter? Oh, you have? Okay. All right. In a museum, yeah. I was waiting for that. Uh, typewriter was a computer keyboard without a screen that used a ribbon and typed directly on paper. It was the keyboard and printer all in one. I'm trying to explain for the younger generation. I mean, I know this sounds simplistic for you older folks, but... You know, the younger generation doesn't understand what a typewriter is. I mean, in the old days, we had to go change the ribbons and those don't. Ah. (laughs) She's trying to act like she's too young to remember. Uh, And I'll admit to you, I learned to type before the days of electric typewriters. We We didn't even have to plug our computer and printer in. You could carry it with you anywhere. You didn't have to have power. You just sat down at this keyboard slash printer and your fingers went to work and lo and behold, the paper would just... Although, although, you had to hit enter at the end of every line. (laughs) Yeah, some of you remember that. You know, they became fancier and they got to the point where they did have a little inner key and you could just hit it and return you know the carriage and then it got to where they developed these word processors and then the computer sprang from there but anyhow at the age of 14 see old preachers never die they just lose their text and wander and I am right back where I started so I didn't I didn't I'm not old yet but um, at the age of 14 I sat down with a typewriter and put together eight typed pages on the subject of water baptism When I got to college years later, I took those typed pages, which I had expanded on through the years. By the time I got to college, I took that and made that my thesis. I worked that into my thesis. So so when I tell you that I've studied this out, I promise you I have studied it out. Um, and, And perhaps the greatest testimony I've found to the definition of the word comes from a man who was a professor at the University of Athens in Athens, Greece. Now, listen, we can sit here and debate Greek words back and forth for hours. But surely a professor at the University of Athens understands the Greek language. Would you agree with me on that point? Dr. A.D. Kiriasko said... The word for in Acts 2.38, and I'm quoting now, does not mean because sins are remitted, but in order that sins may be remitted. What more do I have to say? That man understands the Greek language. That man teaches the Greek language, taught the Greek language. Maybe dead now, I, I don't know. But anyhow, at the time he was a professor. When I read his writings, he was a professor at the University of Athens. And he said unequivocally that the word for, as it appears in Acts 2.38, the word ice, can only mean one thing, and that is so that your sins can be remitted. There is no other way to interpret that verse of Scripture. I'm here to tell you the only way you can have your sins washed away is to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Let's stand and lift our hands. I I won't try to go any farther. I've got a long way to go. But 
I won't try to go any farther tonight. Amen. Praise God. Are you thankful for truth tonight? Well, that was weak. How about the rest of you? Are you thankful for truth tonight? Amen. I'm glad. I'm glad. I understand. I'm glad. I understand. Praise God. There's only one, 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 one way to God. Baptized in Jesus' name. Amen. There's one, 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 one way to God. One, 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 one way to God. One, 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 one way to God. Baptized in Jesus' name. Oh, there's one, one, one. One way to God, one, 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 one way to God. There's only one, 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 one way to God. Baptized in Jesus' name. Well, it's the water and the Spirit, one way to God. The water and the Spirit, one way to God. The water and the Spirit. One way to God, baptized in Jesus' name. There's only one, 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 one way to God. There's one, 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 one way to God. There's only one, 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 one way to God, baptized in Jesus' name. Let's lift our hands and